Hey guys, today's video is going to serve as an introduction to radioactivity. By the end of today's video, in addition to the problem set we're going to work over the course of the next several days, you should feel comfortable with the following three objectives. Number one, I can ascertain if an isotope is radioactive or not radioactive using the band of stability. This is a resource uh, we're going to be working with quite a bit today and over the next few days. Number two, if we've determined that an isotope is in fact radioactive, you should be able to determine whether the type of radiation emitted is going to be alpha, beta, or positron. And number three, using number one and two, can we write nuclear decay equations? So during the course of today's video, we are going to kind of tackle these objectives one at a time, and we'll see how they build upon each other. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing I wanna introduce is just kind of a basic definition, right? So if we have an atom, right? and it's an isotope of some element, whatever element it is we're studying, if we determine that that particular isotope of an element is radioactive, again, using the band of stability, we are going to call that a radioisotope. So pretty straightforward definition. Again, a radioisotope is merely an isotope that's radioactive. So this brings us to kind of the following question. How would we possibly determine that, okay? Um, you will have to go under Canvas and you'll have to open up or perhaps print out uh, what's called the Band of Stability. It's a great resource that's going to allow us to do that with relative ease. Let's take a look. So here is a copy of the Band of Stability. Uh, actually, I have to raise this up a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so what we notice is the following. Okay. It's basically just a graph. Um, we're graphing protons on the x-axis versus neutrons on the y-axis. And if we're studying an atom, right, some isotope of, of an element, if we know the number of protons and if we know the number of neutrons, we can determine whether the isotope is stable. And again, if it is not stable, we can determine whether perhaps it would undergo beta, positron, or perhaps alpha decay. So uh, let's break this down a little bit. Uh, the first thing to note is this line here, this solid line, okay? We're not really gonna use that a whole lot, okay? That is uh, a line that basically just represents a one-to-one -one ratio between neutrons and protons. The band of stability is all these dots. It's all these data points. And those are actually representing stable isotopes, naturally occurring uh, stable isotopes of our common elements, okay? So let's say we were to work a problem and we were to graph you know, the number of protons versus neutrons and let's say we were you know, determining that that data point lied right there. Given that that data point lies amongst otherwise stable isotopes, we would conclude that that is also a stable isotope, that that is going to be a stable atom, okay? Now, should we plot something up over here, up over here, you know, way over here? Because these data points do not lie on the band of stability, we would determine that those are actually radioisotopes, right? They are radioactive, okay? Um, so uh, let's take a look at these three regions. Uh, the first one I wanna focus on is that of beta decay or beta radiation, okay? When it comes to beta decay, um, the way that we would represent beta is, in terms of like the Greek lettering system, uh, beta, minus, okay? So it gets kind of this negative donation there. And the idea with this region on our band of stability is that that nucleus is unstable because it just has too many neutrons per protons, okay? So too many neutrons per protons, that leads to instability. Uh, when we get to our nuclear decay equations and writing these things out and taking a look at uh, um, kind of transmutations is what they call them, as we go from one element and literally become an entirely different element, um, a beta particle is represented as zero over negative one uh, E. It's literally just an electron. So that's what a beta particle is. It's an electron. We're really used to seeing this as you know the, the number of protons. Well, we're talking about an electron, so we don't actually have any protons, right? And we're used to seeing this as the sum of our protons and you know the number of neutrons. And again, we have neither proton nor do we have neutron. Okay, so zero, negative one, E, that's how we're gonna go ahead and represent a beta particle moving forward. And again, that is that region up in here, okay? This is where we're going to find beta decay, or maybe more appropriately, beta minus, okay? Moving on to our next region, um, we are going to take a look at uh, kind of that positron area, 
of the of the graph there. I'm gonna kind of lower this down a little bit. Bum, bum, bum. Cool. Okay. Um, so when it comes to that positron region, um, it, the way that we're going to denote it again from kind of like the Greek notation is uh, it's going to be beta plus. Uh, and the idea with this region here, again, region number two, is that now we actually have kind of flipped the script and we have too many protons per number of neutrons. And again, if you're just really kind of thinking of uh, even just the electromagnetic force, just for ease, um, if you have too many protons in one really, really confined area, obviously it's gonna to lead to some instability, okay? Uh, so what happens is like, in order to kind of achieve stability, a proton will literally get converted into a neutron. And again, we'll see that here in a moment. Um, and the way that that happens, we actually emit or release uh, this, this positron uh, particle, which is actually a form of antimatter. And the way that we'd represent that is very similar to that beta particle, um, but it is zero over plus one E. And this is kind of the peculiar part, right? This is what we would see for a proton. So, when it comes to a positron, a positron is a particle that has the exact same mass as a proton. Um, I'm sorry, it has the mass of an electron. It has the mass of an electron, but it actually carries the charge of a proton. So it's a rather peculiar uh, kind of particle. We really don't see a lot of positron emissions um, that we're going to deal with in this class. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, we have kind of this third area on our graph here. Um, what I would invite you to do is, again, having printed out ideally your own copy, is to make kind of this line here, 83, and I might draw that all the way up, okay? And the idea with that line is that that's representing uh, having 83 or more protons. If ever we are dealing with 83 or more protons, we are going to have alpha radiation on our hands. Okay, the Greek kind of notation for alpha radiation is just kind of like this little, this little fish there. Um, the way that we are going to use it as far as nuclear decay equations, we're gonna represent that as four over two He, uh, which is literally just a helium nucleus, okay? So technically, uh, given that we're just talking about a helium nucleus and absence of electrons, given that we have two protons, two neutrons, it actually carries a charge, uh, but traditionally, we're not going to include that, okay? Um, so four over two helium, we'll see that here again in a moment. Concerning alpha radiation, in this case, the nucleus is simply too large, right? You have too many protons, too many neutrons, all in one confined area. And so it, it literally starts to eject helium nuclei in an attempt to reduce the size of that nucleus, okay? Now again, just a reminder, this happens whenever we have 83 or more protons, we are automatically going to be a radioactive isotope um, and we will look to achieve stability. Uh, by releasing these alpha particles, okay? So, how do we use this thing? How do we actually use the band of stability? Uh, we're gonna work just a couple questions just to figure out how this thing works, okay? Well, first, recall that to use the band of stability, right, our axes are protons and neutrons. So if ever we're given some type of isotope and we're being asked to evaluate, you know, is this a radioisotope, we have to first start with protons and neutrons. So, um, I take a look at oxygen. We're given its mass number, right? That's what that 20 means. And I would have to take a look at our periodic table. Uh, and I would find that the atomic number or the number of protons of oxygen is eight. Okay, so maybe just off to the side, I'm gonna keep track of that. I have eight protons. Again, this right here, that 20, is the sum of neutrons and protons. So if I've already determined that I have eight protons, then I necessarily will have 12 neutrons. So. Once I have kind of, you know, the symbol in hand and I figured out how many protons and neutrons I have, I would use my band of stability and I would literally plot this as a data point. Okay, so again, I'm gonna go over like eight protons and I'm gonna go up 12 neutrons and I find that I'm right around here, okay? Now that's kind of close to tell, right? Like, is that on the band? Is it off the band? Um, we are going to go ahead and say that that is off the band of stability and therefore, it is lying within that beta decay region. So the first thing you're gonna do, uh, well, I guess we've already done this, is to draw your nuclear decay arrow. So you're always gonna start with some isotope. We've already determined that it is a radioactive isotope or a radioisotope. And then from there, given that we've determined it is going to be in that beta region and release a beta particle, you will start by writing what a beta particle is. Now again, going back to earlier, 
we will represent a beta particle as zero over negative one E. Again, it is merely an electron, okay? Well, as the nucleus ejects an electron, we are gonna take a neutron and essentially turn it into a proton. And we'll see kind of how that works here in a second. Now, I think the easiest way to kind of keep track of what's formed, right? So we have oxygen, it's releasing a beta particle. It is literally going to turn into a completely different element. Okay. I always think of this in terms of almost like, a, I don't know, like a math equation. Okay. And what we're looking to do is essentially to fill in three different pieces of uh, missing information. Okay. And the way this is going to work is that again, like all these um, you know, kind of notations have three components, right? You always have like some type of symbol, you have something representing like atomic number, number of protons, and then always something representing your mass number. So imagine this was an equal sign, and that would be a bad habit to get into. Don't use equal signs, use arrows. Um, but the sum of these two numbers right here, okay, so let me maybe kind of outline these a little bit. The sum of these two right here needs to yield this number right here, right here that number eight. So negative one plus some number needs to yield eight, and that number is going to be nine. Okay, so again, nine and negative one, if this is like one side of the equation, has to equal the other side of the equation in terms of the bottom numbers. Okay, so negative one and nine gets us to eight. So that checks out. Now the top is rather easy in this case. Zero plus some number needs to give us 20. Uh, that's obviously gonna be 20, okay? Now, in terms of figuring out what element is formed, recall that it is the atomic number, right? It is the number of protons that actually tells us what the identity of an atom is. And so if we have nine protons, that tells us that we are dealing with the element fluorine with atomic symbol, merely just an F, okay? And so look at how cool this is. I know now that I have nine protons in this fluorine, 20 minus nine is 11 neutrons, okay? So if we compare this versus what we started with, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. In this region, right, the nucleus is unstable because you have too many neutrons. And so we've converted one of those neutrons right, 12 and eight, now we're at 11 and nine. We've converted one of the neutrons to a proton. And we've done that by essentially releasing an electron from the nucleus, okay, or a beta particle. Let's go ahead and move on. The second example is pretty nice. Uh, we're already actually given uh, kind of, you know, a symbol that we can work with straight away in our nuclear decay equation, okay. Um, so again, a little bit of record keeping just to start off. I know that I have now 12 protons. That's what that bottom number tells us. 18 minus 12 tells us that we have six neutrons. So uh, I go to my band of stability and I plot. Uh, I'll use a different color here. I have my 12 uh, protons and I have my six, kind of like right here, maybe neutrons. So I go right here. And I find that that is certainly below the band of stability, right? Where all those dots are here, okay? Um, and so I'm lying within this positron region. So I go back to my symbol. Uh, I start by writing that nuclear decay kind of arrow. And then again, this radioisotope, I, I just determined it was radioactive, hence a radioisotope. The first thing we're gonna do is write out what it is emitting. Now again, a positron is represented as zero over plus one electron, okay? So again, we talk about conservation uh, of kind of like these numbers, right? We want to make sure that the numbers on the right sum to the numbers on the left. So uh, we have kind of our three boxes of missing information that we need to look to fill in. All right, so again, uh, positive one and this number needs to sum together to yield 12. So that number must be 11. Again, the top, pretty easy here. Zero plus some number needs to give rise to the number on the left side of our arrow, 18. So this would be an 18. Okay. Now, begin using that bottom number of 11 uh, as like the number of protons, the atomic number. I would use the periodic table, and I would identify that that element is sodium, Na. And this, again, what we're working on right now is, um, one, determining, you know, is this thing stable or not, right? Is it radioactive or not? And if it is radioactive, based on its placement on the band of stability, what type of particle are we emitting? And then with that information in hand, we are writing out the nuclear decay equation. And what that allows us to do is to determine, hey, if this oxygen isotope is unstable, you know, over time, it's actually decaying into a completely different element. And that's what we're doing, right? Determining what is the element that it looks to become. 
Okay, uh, two more examples, just kind of tidy things up a little bit, and then just a um, just a quick little summary. All right, uh, example number three. Um, we have bromine seventy nine uh, on our hands. Okay, so again, just a little bit of record keeping. Um, bum, bum, bum. Let's see here. Um, so I have thirty five protons. Right, that's what the bottom number bottom number tells me. Um, from there, I need to figure out the number of neutrons. So we'll take uh, 79 minus 35, 79 minus 35, and we come up with 44 neutrons. So with that information in hand, again, I go back to the band of stability and I'll look to plot that. So I have 35 protons and I have 44 neutrons. It's a little high maybe, so right there. Uh, and we'll go ahead and find the intersection of these points. And we're right where that X is. Okay, now to me, that looks like we are pretty much on the band of stability, right? We are amongst all the other data points that are already there um, that, again, are stable isotopes. They're stable versions of the atom. So if this question is asking, you know, one, is it stable or unstable? We're going to say stable. Right? The second thing we talk about, well, if it's stable, what type of radioactive particle is it going to emit? The answer is none, right? Because it's stable. Like, nothing's going to happen. And so we would not actually take the time to write out any sort of nuclear decay equation. Okay? It is unnecessary because this bromine-79 isotope isn't going to do anything. All right, uh, let's go ahead and take it our last example for the day. Uh, we have uranium 238. So back to kind of like this other notation that's uh, frankly not as even common as this one. Okay, but we'll work with it for good measure. So look up uranium on the periodic table. Identify that its atomic number is 92. Again, that mass number of 238 was given to us. So 92 protons. Uh, I could take 238 and subtract from it the 92 to arrive at 146 neutrons. Now, this took seconds, right, to come up with, you know, protons and neutrons. And we were already given protons. The only thing I really had to do was come up with neutrons. But I guess the question would be, did we even need to come up with the number of neutrons? And the answer is that no. No, we did not actually have to come up with the number of neutrons. And here's why. As soon as we determined that uranium had 92 protons, we know that we are in that alpha region, right? We are lying to the right of this red line right here because we have more than 83 protons. And so again, as soon as you identify that the atomic number is larger than 83, right, 83 or larger, we know straight away that not only is it radioactive, it is going to emit an alpha particle in order to become more stable. So again, alpha particles represented as four over two helium. I have my, you know, kind of boxes to fill in for like our missing, you know, element that forms. 2 plus some number needs to yield our 92 over here. That number will be 90. 4 plus some number yields 238. That box is a little small. I'm going to write it up here. So 234. And the element we are left with is thorium. Okay? And this would be a good first step. But for those of you that are rather astute, you might say, well, wait a second. This thorium is also radioactive, right? Because it has 90 protons. Um, so how is it that, like, we just stop there, right? Won't this decay? And the answer is, yeah, that thorium will absolutely undergo alpha decay, right? And it will all, all of a sudden, you know, look to become, um, it will become like radium. And then after, you know, radium with 88 protons undergoes alpha decay, it will become radon and then polonium, and then eventually down to lead, which even lead, you know, undergoes kind of alpha radiation with 82 protons. And that's kind of a discussion for another day. Um, but nonetheless, I think we can stop here with one simple you know, kind of alpha decay example. But again, recognize that, yeah, absolutely, that thorium would actually continue on. Okay, so just to recap, I think some of the big mistakes I see every year is that students are always wanting to write an equal sign here. Do not write an equal sign, right? We are writing nuclear decay equations, and though the term equations may suggest we're using an equal sign, we want to get in the habit of writing an arrow, okay? Uh, the other thing I think um, you know, kind of of note is that as students identify that this might undergo alpha radiation, some students get in the habit of writing that kind of on the reactant side of things. Right, they write something like this, which all of a sudden, you know, if we're talking about you know numbers, 
you know, kind of uh, adding to each other on the same side, they would actually arrive at this answer, which is inaccurate. Okay, so again, whatever you are omitting, you are going to write on the product side of the arrow, which is to say the right side of the arrow. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in, guys.